Hello, I'm Azire. Welcome back to Tokyo Necro. Um, this is actually two days after I finished recording the last episode. Yesterday I wasn't able to record because uh, a pipeline in my house needed to be reworked on. And it was actually inside of my room, so I couldn't do anything inside of my room for the past, uh, well, I guess a day, really. It was working after that, but I couldn't really record when they were working at it because it was really noisy. Um, I'm not sure if I will be recording two episodes or not today to try to, you know, compensate for what happened yesterday. I do not really want to record like multiple episodes at once because like I said, I think the quality of my commentary and also my narration is a bit lacking if I record multiple episodes. But I guess it depends uh, on how it looks like, right? As uh, I play through the game right now. But yeah, short recap. Last time we killed Mitsumi as Ethica. Iria got kidnapped. Ethica is also kidnapped. Ethica's spirit is broken. Iria seems to be under reconstruction as a living dead by Pavlov. As we infer anyway. We didn't necessarily see the scene itself, but we heard screams and such as Ethica. Son. We saw Son. Um. What do you call it? Torturing Olga. And yeah, he's losing his cool after that. And now we're trying to storm the place where Ethica and Iria are currently at, which is... Uh, I forgot the name, but it's like some sort of battleship, right? The Hawaii, I think? But I think that's a good enough recap. Let's actually continue. The Empire Energy Corp must have boarded. I can hear gunship rotors above me, and gunshots and screams around me. Milgram didn't bother redoing my restraints. I even have my beloved rabbit puncher. If I wanted to escape, I could. But... How can I possibly tell everyone? Tell them that I killed Gijo Mitsumi? That I got tricked by Olga's illusions and killed our friend? <laughs> My whole life's been dedicated to killing people who deserve to die. Mitsumin wasn't someone who deserved to die. And yet, with these two hands, I... I did exactly what my old man did. At least you didn't really have too much attachment to Mitsumin and like, you know, Hokoyasu and... What's his name again? Takeyuki? A soldier peeks into my cell. He's part of SAD, the Empire Energy Corps' Special Activities Division. Hell no. But I can't even muster up the energy to curse at him. I just shake my head. This guy probably didn't expect to find any survivors other than her. He looks like he doesn't know what to do. Just leave me alone. Something blows a hole in the SAD soldier's white armor and blood spurts out. He drops to the floor like a ragdoll. A second later, I hear gunshots. The scene playing out in front of my eyes feels so distant. The soldier lost, and thus he was killed. His foe defeated him and stole his life. It happens all the time on the battlefield. He probably had comrades who cared about him. As the SAD soldier falls, a gunfight begins. I can hear shots being fired from all directions. They're screaming too. But none of it feels real. You can all kill each other for all I care. Jeez, Ethica sure got super depressed. I mean, she did kill her friend even though like Mitsumin might not necessarily be as close as say, Tokitaka or Son. They are still comrades somewhat. Eventually, the gunshots stop. 
Steady footsteps echoed on the hallway. I guess the SAD soldiers won. One of them stops at the entrance to my cell. I still hate the fact that the localization does these weird things about the dialogue. He didn't say chih. He's like, just grunting or scuffing, scoffing, you know? He's a stern-looking man with sharp eyes. Seeing as his uniform is different from everyone, everyone else's, he's probably the commander. Hmm. He points his gun down and shoots the SAD soldier lying on the ground. He put a bullet through his former comrade's head without hesitation. It seems cruel, but it's something all soldiers had to do once necromancers joined the fray in the Sino-American War. When a soldier died, their allies blew their brains out. They had to desecrate their co comrades' corpses, or a necromancer would use them. The man in front of me does the same without batting an eyelid. He then points his gun at me. There isn't enough time to react, and I don't have the energy to even if I could. His bullet hits me square in the chest. There's no way Ethica dies though, right? This is like such a weird ending if she dies. What was the point of keeping her alive then in this route? We bring our submarine alongside the Hawaii and board the ship. The snow dusted main deck looks like a scene straight out of hell. Hordes of living dead are converging on the Empire Energy Corps' gunships. They're armed with guns and are forcing their way forward through sheer numbers. That, in and of itself, isn't particularly noteworthy, but the corpses of the re-killed living dead are. Normally, a living dead won't stop unless you shoot it through the head. But most of these corpses don't have head wounds. Like a fire burning through paper, their bodies are slowly being eaten away for, from their torsos. My ex-brain gives me a detailed description. They kind of tell you guys the story about the scavenger really easily in this route, huh? I mean, in the, you know, in the route where Son died, the scavenger was like a super big deal. In this one, they just use it like left and right. The bullets are packed with a genetically enhanced bacteria that breaks down dead tissue. The bacteria are harmless to living organisms with functioning immune systems, but they can dissolve a corpse in a dozen seconds or so. I guess, technically speaking, during the route where Soen died, they weren't really outside of the Tokyo Mega Float, so I guess they weren't equipped with the scavenger yet. It makes sense, but it feels like I have to make my own reasoning to make the game make sense, you know? Instead of the game to pro providing me with enough information. It's precisely the kind of weapon a co company with advanced biotechnology like the Empire Energy Corp would develop. The effects are rapid and aggressive. These bullets should easily rev revolutionize anti-living dead warfare, should they ever be mass-produced. Unfortunately, there are just too many living dead. No matter how many of them the SAD soldiers kill, more keep spilling out of the elevator. While the scavengers are certainly effective, there's a limit to how many bullets you can carry. This is something I know well, as a professional living dead stalker. Indeed, the soldiers protecting the gunships are currently being overwhelmed by the living dead's sheer numbers. Sadly, we don't have bullets to spare on these guys. We sprint across the deck and enter the ship's belly. The ship's interior is quite cold. Tokyo may be a city full of death, but it would still be hard to gather this many corpses without some kind of system in place. According to Konsu's analysis, the amphibious assault ship Hawaii was being used by the human trafficker Olga for some time. I suspect Milgram and his cronies were hiding the corpses they collected aboard this ship in preparation for this fight. The reason the ship is kept at such a low temperature is to pre prevent the corpses from rotting. 
It's possible the corpses of people who died in the experiments being conducted at the fortress were transferred directly to the ship. Living dead aren't our only enemy down here. Enemies down here. If the Empire Energy Corp really is after Iria, then we'll have to beat them to her. We have to take advantage of the current chaos and rescue her as fast as possible. Which is why we're splitting up the search for her more efficiently. The two of us head off in opposite directions, following the plan we came up with before the, before the operation. I dash at full speed down the narrow, pipe-filled hallway. <laughs> I throw the old man who tries to grapple me, slip past the old lady with a katana, and kick the gun out of the child's hands. You know, I'm pretty surprised that Sohn is still using his X-Brain in this route. I would have thought that because, uh, because of, you know, what happened and how emotional he becomes, he started using his intuition more rather than the X-Brain. But I guess he might still do that, probably at the climax or something. My ex-brain understands that re-killing these living dead isn't our main objective. I reflexively go in the direction my ex-brain tells me to, ducking through a no small doorway. Kansu downloaded the ship's blueprints when she hacked into the fortress. Amachi Juichiro was a man with many enemies, and he extensive extensively remodeled the ship in case he needed to use it to escape his castle. Our biggest advantage over the Empire Energy Corp is that we have a complete grasp of the ship's layout. The upper floors that house the crew cabins have, have seen a good amount of fighting already. If SAD has already gotten to Iria, we won't be able to get her back by force. My ex-brain realizes this as well and tells me to prioritize the lower floors. I continue forward, taking care of any living dead that lunge at me from the shadows. Most large hi-fi wouldn't be able to maneuver in a tight space like this, so it's mostly low-fi coming at me. Fortunately, I'm able to make it to the lowest floor without much trouble. They're gonna hide the fact that Ikatsu is alive in this route, aren't they? The engine's rumbling vibrates my helmet as I walk across the high ceiling room. This unusually warm room is the Hawaii's engine room. There's three stories of scaffolding surrounding the turbine engines, and a maze of pipes extends around it in all directions. Past this should be the ship's armory. My ex-brain believes there's a high possibility that Iria is being held, here, held there. An alert flashes, and I immediately adjust my grip on my real eliminators. My ex-brain then tells me to look. No, that... No, nah, I think that's Pavlov. That's not Ikatsu. Up. Yeah, see, the string really makes him obvious. A giant of a man is hanging upside down from the ceiling. Mitsumi provided me his battle data a while back. The moment my ex-brain gives me permission to fire, I pull the trigger. But Pavlov is far more nimble than I expected. I try to keep him in my real eliminator sights, but he's too fast. I take an unbelievably heavy blow and get sent flying through the air. Ignoring the pain and the heat scorching my back, I climb to my feet. Indeed, my ex-brain provides me with information on his weapon and fighting style. His eccentric movements are made possible by the thin wires extending from his arms. He's wrapped those wires around the pipes in this room and is using them to move effortlessly in all directions. They're CNT wires, super strong threads made of carbon nanotubes. You know, I I don't know why I just realized that this, but if this X-Brain was used by Takeyuki, 
Why is the, you know, quote-unquote soul that resides in this x brain zones, right? After a zone dies in multiple routes. Wouldn't it make sense to... Uh, that the x brain would be Takeyuki's? Sure, Soen was the one who used it after Takeyuki's dead. Huh. I don't know, may maybe maybe Takeyuki just didn't use it for that long. And Soen used it much longer, I don't know. I think I might be thinking too much about this. It might not matter in the long run. He shoots them out and reels them back in by using the superconducting motors in his gauntlets. What's more... My thoughts are interrupted by Pavlov's lightning-fast approach. He launches his CNT wires, trapping me on all sides. All sides except up, that is. I holster my real eliminators and leap up under the catwalk in the nick of time. I mean, this might be a trap soon. Pavlov's wires grace my feet, and a second later, steam erupts from down from below me. His superheated wires must have sliced open a valve. He's heating them via remote jewel heating, according to my X-Brain. It's familiar with his weapon. Familiar? The same way it was familiar with Tang Yun Shan's electromagnetic blades. Oh, okay. Memories passed down from its previous owner. I take aim at Pavlov and pin him down with my real eliminators. He nonchalantly blocks all the bullets with one arm, then shoots out another wire. Ignoring gravity, he launches his massive body into the air. He cuts through a number of pipes with his heated wires, causing high-pressure steam to shoot out from various angles. His silhouette dashes past me numerous times, though it's hard to make out through the steam. He goes right, then left, then up, then down. Unfazed by the heat of the steam, he dances around the room. Because of how obs obscured my vision is, even my X-Brain can't fully predict his movements. It suggests he's retreating from this room. But I reject that suggestion. If Pavlov was waiting for me here, there's a high chance Iria is past him. Hey, this is actually one of the first times that Sone rejects uh, his X-Brain. Maybe the first time, in fact. I can't afford to run away. Found him. Years of following my X-Brain su suggestions have honed my reaction time. However, Pavlov's still a fraction of a second faster than me. If we take each other out, it'll be my loss, since I won't be able to rescue Iria. I immediately jump backwards and go down a story. Pavlov uses his wires to forcibly change direction and runs vertically down one of the pipes on the wall. I can't escape. He grabs my face with his right hand and slams me down onto the catwalk. My mind goes blank. He's too strong. How on earth did my ex brain fight this monster in the past? The only thing keeping me moving through my despair is its suggestions. I follow its orders. Desperately trying to claw my way to, to victory. If those wires wrap around my neck and start heating up, I'll be beheaded instantly. I fire my real eliminators at Pavlov's gauntlets, crushing the openings he uses to shoot his wires. But the situation is only marginally better now. <laughs> My breath catches in my throat as he presses down on me. Pavlov's cyborg body weighs more than 300 kilograms. I think for people in the US, that's about 660 pounds or something like that. Might be mistaken though. I believe a pound is like 
or one kilogram is about 2.2 pounds, so I think that's right. 660, right? Meanwhile, I don't even weigh 70. Hey, same zone. I mean, zone is pretty tall, so the fact he doesn't weigh 70 kilograms means that he's really, you know, lean. Unable to resist. I can only watch as he grabs my arms. He steals my real eliminators and tosses them away. Without my reliable partners, I feel powerless. His fists slam into me. Right, then left, then right again. He's punching me so hard his fists are becoming deformed. An unenhanced human body wouldn't be able to withstand this much force. Oh, okay, the X-Brain is gonna break at this point, right? Not even my X-Brain can fully cushion the impact. My head rattles around inside my helmet. Then again, I think Kansu can actually fix the X-Brain. Think this happened before on another route? Pavlov has me pinned down with his body weight, so I have no hope of escaping. Blow after blow after blow. My consciousness slowly begins to fade. My X-Brain starts to cave in. There's cracks in my vision. Static fills my display, and I hear the sound of something shattering. Shit. At this rate. At this rate. You're over-reliant on the X-Brain zone. My old man changed after the Sino-American War ended. He joined the military police and did everything he could to climb up the ranks. He used his army connections, betrayed his, com his old comrades, and even resorted to violence. That's when people started calling him the Iron Tyrant. I hated the person he'd become. He didn't seem human anymore. I swore to myself that I'd never grow up to be someone like him. When was it that I found out my old man was sneaking out of the house every night? He'd slip past the mansion staff and make his way to the botanical garden. I thought for sure he was sneaking out to meet a lover or something. One night, I decided to follow him and see if I couldn't get... If I... Could get some blackmail material. There's a typo there. Shino Bazu Pond was silent beneath the moonlight. I saw my old man sitting at the gazebo on Benton Island. He had his elbows on a table and was looking quietly up at the night sky. Was he waiting for someone? I observe him from behind a nearby tree. The night breeze carried with it the faint scent of lotus petals. I remember waiting there for hours. In fact, I waited so long that I started getting sleepy. I was still young enough that then that I wasn't used to staying up late. At some point, I nodded off. When I came to, I realized my old man was gone. I'd missed the moment he met up with his lover. Annoyed at myself, I scanned the gazebo to see if I could find any hints to who he had met up with. I checked the images my Conry had taken, but I couldn't find footprints belonging to anyone other than my old man. I'd almost had him, but at the crucial moment, I'd fucked up. Disappointed, I sat down on the same bench my old man had and rested my head in my hands. It was then that I noticed the table was wet. I looked back up at the sky, but in the botanical garden, it only rained at set intervals. There was no way the sprinklers had just sprayed out a few drops like this. Which meant there was only one thing these drops could be. Everyone called my dad the Iron Tyrant. Even when he was with me, he acted more like a machine than a man. But here in this garden, he'd been shedding tears. The reason he'd come here alone in the middle of the night was so no one would find out. This was the night where it finally clicked for me. My old man hadn't lost his emotions. He was just desperately hiding them from everyone. I hated him even more after I learned that. 
I mean, think about it. If you're happy, you laugh. If something's pissing you off, you get mad. And when things get tough, you cry. That's what it means to be human. If I was being honest with myself, I actually loved my old man. I wanted him to cry, to laugh, to cry, to feel joy, and to get angry, angry. I wanted him to express all of his emotions. That's all. In the end, that's probably all, all I really wanted. But you never said this shit though. You said that if you were unhappy about something, you could you could try changing shit. I I don't I have absolutely 100% guaranteed that Ethica never actually talked to this about or with his dad. Like come on. What a hypocrite. That's what Ethica is. Well, that was a weird dream. There's no blood here where the SAD guy shot me. The bullet shattered the flavor capsule in my breast pocket. Now it smells like lotus petals. That's probably why I dreamt about what happened at Shinobazu Pond. I looked down at the corpse of the SAD soldier still lying outside my cell. It's more than just his head that's been damaged. In fact, it looks like most of his corpse has been liquefied. He's turned into... Well, not exactly a puddle. More like a lump of dissolved flesh. The bullet that SAD commander fired into my chest was special. It didn't have much piercing power, but there was a certain liquid embedded inside it. That liquid is probably something that accelerates the decomposition of dead flesh. Meaning that guy shot me because he thought I was a living dead. Can't say I blame him. There's this huge commotion on the ship, and I was just leaning against the wall doing nothing. Fucking hell. This sucks. I don't even know if I can do this anymore. Maybe I can't. I want to run away. I want to cry. This is too much to bear. But... Every breath I take fills my lungs with the scent of lotus petals. I grab my portable chainsaw. I'm not gonna run, and I'm not gonna hide. Not from joy, not from sadness, not from anger, and definitely not from my own sins. I'm gonna make it out of this alive. I'm gonna survive, and I'm gonna repent for what I did. And I'm gonna cry my heart out in Kiri's chest. Who's that? The sun blazes down in a dusk caked wasteland in the Middle East. I am standing in the middle of the what of that wasteland. <coughs> Are we like uh dreaming or something? A horde of living dead are advancing upon me. Or is this like a memory for from Takeyuki? My brain automatically reacts to my ex-brain suggestions. But my body doesn't move. My legs are heavy. My arms feel like lead. And I can't keep my grip on my weapons. Lactic acid is built up in my muscles, dulling their movements. I don't have any bullets, bullets left. I'm not gonna say wham. <laughs> <laughs> That's so weird. I don't know why they even have that uh, sound effect in text form. I drive my muzzle spikes into the living dead skulls, crushing them. But no matter how many I kill, more keep on coming, like a swarm of insects. Come to think of it, there was a movie much like this. I must have slain over a thousand living dead by now. My real eliminators, the symbols of the close quarters armed martial arts training unit are caked in dusky red blood. My grip strength finally fails me, and the pistol in my right hand falls to the ground. That makes me lose my focus. My X-Brain suggests attempting, attempting a recovery using my remaining pistol, but there isn't enough time. 
The living dead clamber over the corpses of their allies and grab my arms and legs. They pull me to the ground and pile on top of me. There's only one way this ends. My death. I hear a familiar voice from beyond the black screen. This is... Ethica's father. Major General Kibanohara's voice, isn't it? Huh? A voice I haven't heard in a long time. Ikatsu's answers. However, Ikatsu sounds far younger than I remember him. <laughs> I'm the one who says that last sentence as I step down from the treadmill and take off my prototype X brain. So that's how you look, huh, Takeyuki? ヒアク的に精度が上がってますね。これなら実用に頼る。ブスジマ研究室で優秀な研究者が見つかってな。麻生ゆかり君でしたっけ随分仲がいいみたいじゃないですか。やめてくれないか。私とゆかり君はそうい
ソウンと名付けようと思ってますおおいい名前じゃねえかなっ矛安ああ Hoko Yasu looks rather pale. I mean, considering what we know of Hoko Yasu in, in、uh, Kiri's route, it's understandable that he'd be kind of envious right now. Eh. <laughs> Okoyasu lapses in the thought. Senso ga watara do s u r t s m o r i s k a Gunni no kote kinkyu demo t s u k e r daro. Tadashku necromanci o t s k a e v a shakai ni kio de kiru hazda. Narodo Kiba no harashi. Senso ga watara Ure sama wa lio koto ke konsuru. Ah. Hm? Nanda o m r a いや、大丈夫だ。お前なら何を言っても結局死にはしないだろう。うん I guess that was a death flag, wasn't it? He c a u g h t to cock his head to one side and I chuckle. As my consciousness gets pulled back to the present for the second time, I finally realize what's going on. The X brain is used to expand one's subconscious. However, the X brain I'm using now originally belonged to my father. Nago Kataki Yuki. Was the vision I saw just now one of his old memories? Am I experiencing his past through my ex brain? Ex Brian? <laughs> Come on! I keep saying this, but this game really needs better QC. I get it, this game has a shit ton of text, but come on. A swarm of living dead emerge from the trees. They used to be my students. With the development of the X Brain, the Close Quarters Armed Martial Arts Training Unit was brought to the front lines in the war against living dead. By using a machine to supplement the human brain's decision making process, CQAMA was able to save a staggering number of lives. But it wasn't able to save everyone. You know, <laughs> I find it really funny the fact that we are being pummeled right now and Soen is just seeing this、uh, slowly experiencing his、uh, dad's memory. Whenever things got dicey, and don't tell me this is like inside of his brain, okay? This definitely happens in real time. He specifically said the display was showing him memories, okay? Whenever things got dicey, the army would always rely on the CQAMA training unit and me, their ace. I shoot and shoot and shoot. With pinpoint accuracy, I carry out my ex brain's orders. There's no time to get emotional over killing the corpses that used to be my students. If nothing else, they're at least being sent to the afterlife by, my, by real eliminators, the heart and soul of, clo- of the close quarters armed martial arts training unit. Corpses of corpses pile on top of each other, creating a mountain of dead flesh. The star of today's show makes his entrance. His luminescent wires. Form beautiful curves through the air as they head towards me. But they miss my neck and slice off the arm of the living dead behind me. The superheated, super strong wires he's using don't have any matches in my ex brain's database. Meaning, there's some new weapon the necromancers developed. I like how they use the, like,、uh, forest, like, design, because, um,、uh, It's sort of almost just like the botanical garden, right? Or the background. It's crazy, that's why. I say nothing. My ex brain doesn't tell me what my father was thinking in this moment either. Pavlov raises his hand and shoots a wire into the air. It wraps around a tree branch and he activates the, the winch to lift them up. 
As you rise us into the air, the remaining living dead rush me in unison. They don't have guns and seem to be trying to tackle me instead. I dodge the corpse coming at me from the front. A second later, its head goes flying as Pavlov's wire cut through it. He clearly has no com compu compunction? What is that? About re-killing his creations if it'll help him land a blow against me. Why can't you just say hesitation like a normal person? His plan is to cut me down along with his, with his living dead. It's inhumanly difficult to defend against the endless wave of corpses coming at me when there's also Pavlov's wires to contend with. If I get caught even once, it's over. However, I have an X-Brain, the most reliable ally one could hope for, on my side. And I have the two real eliminators I have so much faith in. Those who knew Nagoka Takeyuki all called his fighting style an art form. For the first time in my life, I understand what they meant. It takes my father only a minute. Just one minute to slaughter the veritable army of living dead. Pavlov doesn't hesitate. He launches wires out of both hands in a desperate attempt to claim my life. The foliage around me is cut to ribbons as the glowing threads dance across the night sky, leaving dazzling afterimages in their wake. The human eye cannot hope to process such complex movements, but the X-Brain can. It analyzes the wire's trajectories and calculates the optimal move out of the options at hand. It even manages to predict what Pavlov's going for. Man, such a cheat ability, or such a cheap cheat um, item. Caught you. The giant of a man sails through the air. The wires Pavlov shot out had all been decoys. His true intention had been to close the distance between us and bring the fight into close quarters so he could better leverage his size advantage. I'm smart enough not to fight force with force though. Instead, I use his own force against him. All I need is to grab his pinky, and I'm able to send him flying using the energy of his own charge. The battle has been decided. At this range, I can't miss. However, Pavlov doesn't beg for his life. He looks up at the twinkling stars and mutters, I don't hesitate. But he's still alive. I guess he's reanimated right now. I pull the trigger and my bullet tears through Pavlov's heart, spilling crimson blood everywhere. How many years has it been? From the picture, it looks like uh, Soen was still like a kid, right? So at the very least, I think it's more than 10 years. Maybe 15 years at this point, if someone's 18 or something. I'm in awe at my father's fighting skills. Even though he had to deal with Pavlov's wires targeting him from behind, he was able to slaughter an absurd number of living dead in just one minute. Not only that, he wasn't even out of breath by the end of it. Nagoka Takeyuki defeated Pavlov with such ease, it made the giant seem harmless. The stars are twinkling high above the sea. It's a sight you almost never see in Tokyo. I carry Major General Hokuyasu across the beach as a red stain slowly spreads across my stomach. It's a pretty deep wound, but if we can make it back to camp, I should be fine. Takeyuki. <laughs> The only sounds that can be heard are the crash of waves against the beach and boots crunching in the sand. 
But that soon changes. <laughs> Ikatsu's booming laughter shatters the silence. Man, I guess Ikatsu is somewhat similar to Rance, isn't he? Though, I think that Ikatsu doesn't really have the brains like Rance, though, to become a schemer. He's definitely more bronze than brain. Rance is like uh, a bit more brawn than brain, but he still has the brains to actually use some evil schemes. Sakiko? <laughs> Ikatsu points to a cargo plane flying overhead. Kibanohara. <laughs> What an idiot, though. Who the fuck actually wants to come see their, like, uh, husband in a fucking battlefield? You're dumb as bricks. I don't, I don't, like, consider that devotion or anything. That's actually retarded. Are you kidding me? Like, he's just gonna come back. I mean, he might die, but... I don't know, maybe he wants to, she wants to die together or something in the event that... They, you know, Takeyuki doesn't come back. But what the fuck? <sighs> I look up at the sky. I have no way of knowing what kind of expression my father is making. But according to my ex-brain, he's trembling in joy. Up above in the star-studded st sky. A giant of a man shoots out a pair of thin wires. How is Pavlov here? I shot him through the heart just a few minutes ago. I immediately draw my real eliminators. Still dangling from a tree, the giant points up at the sky. Right at the cargo plane heading this way. It explodes. I'm confused though. How did Soon notice his parents like have sex? If by this point, Takeyuki and Sakiko are both dead. Like, did he notice that? Like, when he was like one year old? And he still retains that, you know, that memory? I know some kids actually retain some form of memory, but... I, don't, I doubt they actually have any form of self to realize or to be able to distinguish what they're feeling at that point. There's no way that Son actually thinks, looking at sex and be like, disgusting. That doesn't make sense, especially at the age of one. I thought that his sense of disgust was seeing that Takeyuki was having sex with, her, with you know, his dead wife. That would make sense. But that would also mean that Son would be a couple years older, not one year old. Now I'm kind of seeing some cracks in the story, but... We'll have to progress and see what going what goes on. Was that? Could it be? <laughs> I run to the crash site. Amidst the burning wreckage, I see her. Man, your voice acting is not as good as Son, Takeyuki. My beloved wife. I 
counter Pavlov's this descending fist with a headbutt. He probably hadn't been expecting that. In fact, he probably thought I didn't have the strength left to fight back. The surprise attack throws Pavlov off balance. I'm not done yet. I bend backwards, using my entire body like a spring, and continue slamming my head against his fists. So, and you're kinda bleeding there. Over and over and over. Oh my god! Oh my god! My barrage of headbutts eventually forces Pavlov back. As soon as I'm free, I grab Pavlov's color and use all of my might to throw him backwards. With his implants, Pavlov weighs around 300 kilograms. He slips over the railing and hits the ground with such force that the entire catwalk, catwalk shakes. I retrieve my real eliminators and chase after him. さんを殺さなきゃならなかったんだ。ミルグラム様の命令です。ミルグラムの。この世界に絶望するために戦場にやってきて、彼は見つけてしまったんです。この世界で最も美しいもの。私には見えない何か。それ I get an alert warning me that I'm too worked up. It's fine. There's no problem. I defeated my foe. My injuries are minor. Pavlov turned his face away at the last second, but I still shot him through the head. Necromancers are wanted dead or alive. I mean, gotta remember what happened last time he was still alive after your dad shot him through the head. There might be something, you know with him that makes him not dead, even after you shoot him. Besides, this man was already shot through the head, through the heart once. If that didn't kill him, it means he was a living dead, and could only be neutralized by destroying his brain. I did the right thing. I know I did. I take a few deep breaths. It's hard to catch my breath in this steam-filled room, though. Eventually, I manage to compose myself and get to my feet. My experience is still going through its error check, but I already know where I need to go. Past this door is a bulkhead, and past that should be the armory. I pull the door open. <laughs> Iria is at the end of the hallway. But that distance won't be easy to cross. There's an endless army of living, living dead standing between us. I mean... Pavlov can't be a living dead though, because in the other route, he was actually controlling the living dead. Huh. I don't get how living dead work. So, if a living dead was a necromancer before, and they turn into a living dead, can they still command other living deads? Is that how it works? None of them are armed. Instead, they have their arms spread wide in an attempt to capture and restrain me. Their actions are identical to what the living dead in the Malaysian jungle were doing when they tried to hold down Nag Nagaoka Takeyuki long enough for Pavlov to slice him with his wires. I hear someone jump up behind me. 
Sighing heavily, I turn around. Yeah, see, there must be something going on with his body that makes him not die. Did he like remove his brain somewhere else on his part of on like part of his body or some shit? What is going on with this guy? The two holes I open in Pavlov's head are emitting pale blue sparks. The inside of his head is filled not by a brain, but mechanical sensors. He's also pried back open the holes on his gauntlets to make his CNT wires usable again. I have no idea how he's still moving. But that doesn't matter. What's important is that I've been pincered. If any of the living dead catch me, Pavlov will cut me apart from behind. In order to rescue Iria, I need to take care of him and make my way to the end of the hall. My ex-brain com completes its error check and resumes normal operation. Brandishing his wires, Pavlov quietly walks forward. I ready my re-eliminators and prepare myself for the battle to come. It took my father only one minute. I should be able to do the same. See, here's the thing though. If my, what my prediction is correct about Iria, whether someone survives this battle and defeats Pavlov, Iria has already been turned into a living dead. I take the gun off the corpse of the SAD soldier outside my cell. Everything about its design screams made by Empire Energy Corp, but it's got a full magazine of those corpse-eating bullets, so I can't complain. Nice. I've even got a test dummy right here. He charges at me with his knife, but when I shoot him, he doubles over. The place where I shot him in the flank has begun to decompose and is no longer able to support his upper body. In less than 20 seconds, the living dead is nothing more than a lump of flesh. Yeah, this is more than enough for ghouls. If it works just as fast on high fives too, then it'll be a handy weapon to have around. The bullets don't do much physical damage, but if I need pure destructive power, I've got my chainsaw. The hallway is filled with lumps of flesh. I'm guessing they used to be living dead. There's also a pretty decent number of SAD corpses. They've been re they've really been going at it, huh? Now then, what should I do? No way in hell I'm gonna ask these SAD fucks for help. Besides, their top priority is completing their mission anyway. Plus, there's a good chance they're not here for Milgram, but for Iria. I'd like to save Iria if I, if I can, but this ship is huge. I have no idea where they took her, and a lot of times passed since SAD started their attack. These guys are tearing through the living dead, so for all I know, they've secured Iria already. In which case, the best course of action is... Hell yeah! I'm a genius! Whatever, Ethica. Bang, bang, bang. I pumped the nearby living dead full of dissolving juice as I dashed down the hallway. The Empire Energy Corps' new, newest weapon really packs a punch. All of the living dead turn into puddles of flesh goop in seconds. Whatever's in these bullets is one hell of a cocktail. If the energy elites had shit like this, they should have told us sooner. Grumbling to myself, I make my way to the main deck. Who would be the best person to capture for a hostage exchange? The first person that comes to mind is that SAD commander fuck with the beady eyes. If I kidnap their leader, those SAD guys will probably be willing to trade him for Iria. And this way, I can get back at him for shooting me. I don't think so. I don't think so, Ethica. But while I really want to pay him back, there's no guarantee I can find him on this giant ship. Hell, he might have been killed and turned into a living dead. Hence why I'm heading up to the deck. The roar of the gunships has gotten a lot quieter, meaning they've probably landed on the ship. If I can steal their transportation, that's another good way of forcing them to negotiate. See? Now that's where you're talking. Probably, I think.
Is this the hangar? Amphibious assault ships usually have helicopters on board, but it doesn't look like this one has, it, has any. Instead, the hangar is filled with a mountain of neutralized living dead, and the floor is slick with dissolved flesh. They were probably stored here before being sent out to the main deck via the elevator. There's so much blood and carrion- Carrion? I don't know what that is. On the floor that it starts sticking to my boots after just a few steps. Don't envy the guy who has to clean this place. A pale beam of light shines into the room. The giant elevator slowly begins to descend. Standing amidst the falling snow is a giant black figure. It doesn't look quite human though. If anything, it looks more like... Oh wow, we are fighting Ikatsu in this one. It has four legs at least. But the top half of a human is growing out of the place the head and neck should be. This is like a, a centaur, right? It has thick armor covering every inch of its body and a gas mask over its face. This definitely doesn't look like the kind of thing SAD would make. Seeing as it's on the ship, it's probably one of Laboratory's newfangled high fives. The living dead we fought at the Ikebukuro CPC and the fortress all had a few screws loose too. The weird panting coming from this thing's gas mask makes it sound like one of one hell of a perv. If only reporting it for public indecency would get it carted away by the military police. At least you can still make some jokes, Ethica. Glad to have you back. I unload a few rounds at the centaur, but its armor deflects them all. These bullets weren't designed with penetrative power in mind, since they don't need it. Hell, they couldn't even pierce my clothes. If this fucker had even a little bit of skin showing, I could have aimed for that, but oh well. I sling the rifle over my back and pull out my chainsaw. As long as I can create even a tiny opening, my new toy can take care of the rest. I lunge at the centaur, and he blocks my chainsaw with a spear rifle. Holy fuck he's strong! He's easily able to parry my full strength blow with the rifle's bayonet. Without missing a beat, he follows up with a reverse thrust. I try to put some distance between us, but this fucking floor is too goddamn slippery. I drop a hand to the ground to stab stabilize myself as I slip and slide away. This guy is pretty tough. Gonna have to use my head a little. The moment I raise my head, I sense someone right behind me. He blocked my escape route. The centaur's four legs give him explosive bursts of speed and keep his grip on the floor steady. Even with all the blood and guts everywhere, he has no problem outmaneuvering me. He's pretty fast with that rifle spear too. It's gonna be hard to take him on when my footing's this bad. In fact, I'm not even sure how I should deal with the thrusts coming for me right now. Should I aim for a counter and try to take him down with me? Wait, shit! I let my focus slip for a second and my feet lose purchase on the ground. Thankfully, that slip up saves my life. Me tripping was as, was as unexpected for him as it was for me. The centaur isn't able to read my movements. His rifle spear flies a hair's breadth over my head. I twist my body to the side and swing my chainsaw up. Sparks fly as it clashes with, this, with the rifle spear. I then drop my hand back to the ground and successfully manage to put some distance between us this time. My last swing was strong enough to cut the centaur's rifle spear in half. Problem is... Now he's just dual wielding. I guess that weapon was originally two rifles glued together or something. Seemingly unfazed, the centaur stares, at, stares me down with his twin rifle spears. Hmm... Yeah... This guy's pretty damn tough. I bring a hand up to my still dormant x brain. Oh, she's gonna use it. I mean, I guess at this point, she's not really going to... You know, talk shit about... Pokoyasu anymore. 
My record ends up the same as my father's. Exactly one minute. I executed my ex-brain suggestions and carried out my job to perfection. Even after all the damage I got, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like this game is a bit too, you know, unrealistic with the amount of endurance someone has after a beatdown. I dodged Pavlov's CNT wires, avoided the living dead trying to capture me, re-killed them all, and made it to Iria. I turn around to see Pavlov staring at me with the remaining chunk of his head. I start up my MPP. Pavlov brandishes his wires and they begin to glow. He shoots wires out to my left and right, then charges forward. I've already seen this tactic once before. The memories my ex-brain showed me, the battles my father fought, have been etched into my brain. My ex-brain should easily be able to calculate the movement patterns of Pavlov's CNT wires. I expect a suggestion will appear soon. But I start moving before the suggestion appears. Turning to the side, I evade the first wire. A few seconds later, the suggestions have confirmed that the actions I took on instinct were indeed correct. I then leap up and fire my pistols at Pavlov's left gauntlet. Again, my X-Brain affirms my course of action. The X-Brain's purpose is to expand its user's subconscious. It brings the subconscious calculations a person's conscious mind can't act on to the surface by interpreting them and displaying them as, as suggestions. That's why I thought I needed to become a machine that could turn, turn the X-Brain's input into the appropriate output. But after seeing Nago Katakyuki's fights from his perspective, I realized he was on a completely different level. He wasn't following his X-Brain suggestions. He wasn't a machine who turned input into output. No. He was performing both input and output at, at the same time, cutting the time from thought to action to zero. To Nago Katakiyuki, the x brain was nothing more than an answer key, a way to double check that his actions were indeed optimal. When there was a problem his own brain couldn't solve, he relied on his, on his x brains help. In doing so, he used his x brain to train his real brain. I take a half step backwards and throw out a feint. My X-Brain affirms my course of action. My physical brain is finally catching up to my X-Brain. It's evolving to surpass its limits. There's no longer any time, any time lag as I transform input, into input to output. This is the secret to Nago Katakiyuki's fighting style. It's time I made it my own. In the same way that analyzing my X-Brain suggestions helps my brain evolve, Tracing the memories I experience helps my body evolve. I can tell that my skills have reached new heights. A sliver of uncertainty worms its way into Pavlov's stoic expression. I grab him by the pinky and throw him. My ex-brain affirms my course of action. I don't fight force with force. Instead, I use my opponent's force against them. Pavlov rushed forward to bring things into close quarters, but the force behind that rush backfired. You know, you'd think that Pavlov, after fighting Takeyuki, would develop a new strategy, but he's still using the same freaking strategy. Come on, Pavlov. You're not like full machine. There's got to be some sort of creative thing for you to do. Someone has the freaking X brain for Pete's sake. I load the opioid cocktail bullet my MPP printed into my re-eliminator. Pavlov didn't die when my father shot him in the heart, and he didn't die when I shot him in the head. But what about sending a lethal injection of drugs into his bloodstream? This MPP, which even my father didn't possess, is my secret weapon. You know, this also poses the question of how, about how this guy dies so easily, killed by, like, Mitsumi's brother. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? Like, Mitsumi's brother thrust him and then cut him in half, but... You'd think that he would still survive after all that. Like, what the fuck? This guy's a monster! How did he die so easily in that route? Now this fight is really over. Pavlov slowly looks up at me. Doesn't seem he was shot by someone there. Clumps of gray matter fly out of Pavlov's stomach. Someone shot him from behind. Despite how sudden this is, I understand what's going on. Pavlov wasn't a living dead, but rather a cyborg, cyborg who remade his body using the flesh of corpses. For both necromancers and living dead, their brains are their weak point. After remaking his body so many times, Pavlov realized there were no tangible merits to keeping his brain in his head. So instead, he buried it in his stomach. Okay, I guess because, you know, Mitsumi's brother cut his stomach open, he died. But man, that was such a cheap way to kill him off in that route. That was why he was able to keep moving even after having his heart shot or his head crushed. I see now why my father was unable to kill him. But now his corpse is still. The brain fragments that flew out of his stomach are slowly being dyed red by his blood. An SAD unit clad in their distinctive white uniform uniforms run runs in from the back. They make way for their commander who steps forward. Yamanuma speaks calmly, protected by his men. Their guns are probably using real bullets instead of scavengers, seeing as the last shot punched straight through Pavlov's torso. SAD is composed of highly trained elites that the Empire Energy Corp has gathered from around the world. How can I get myself out of this situation? How can I rescue Iria? My ex-brain remains quiet. That in itself is a merciless declaration that there's no way out of the situation without giving Iria up. I know. I know it's impossible, but... Up until now, Iria's been alone. She spent her childhood as one of the Kabukuro CPC's lap rats. After that, she was confined in the fortress, and then she got kidnapped by a laboratory. The whole time she was alone, cut off from the world. But now she finally had a chance to experience normal life. She was finally able to spread her wings and fly out of her cramped cage. And yet the Empire Energy Corp is trying to stuff her back into it. I won't allow it. I don't care if... So... See, this is also like an interesting, like, uh, theory, right? So if what happened to Ryoko is happening to Iria right now, that means that, um, Pavlov can't give any instructions to Iria, right? So she should be having her own free will until her emotions got cut off from being a living death for too long. But can she be, like, controlled by Milgram? I don't know. Or has she always been, like, Milgram's puppet after what Pavlov did to her? Iria's voice snaps me out of my spiral of pessimistic thoughts. Oh, 
宝魚イリアの力が必要だそんなの信じられそうイリア leaps into my arms she's trembling but I can sense her determination イリア She looks up at me. Her smile is wide. I can't move. All I can do is stand here and watch. Even though this must be unbelievably painful for her, Ariel walks over to the SAD soldiers like it's the easiest thing in the world. They form up around her and escort her out of the room. In seconds, she's completely out of sight. The Empire Energy Corp has stolen Iria away. Yamanuma, who stayed behind, turns to me and mutters. Yeah, I know. The Empire Energy Corp doesn't care one whit about the lives of Tokyo's residents. Had I fought, those SAD soldiers would have killed me without hesitation. I hear the sound of a pin being removed, and Yamanuma throws a grenade my way. It's not a standard grenade either, it's a scattershot grenade that propels itself upwards with compressed air. It'll explode in midair and launch sharpnel in all directions, which is far more dangerous than a regular explosive. I won't be able to run away in time. Does it still count as dual wielding if you're using guns and not swords? I don't know. But the Sagittarius kicks up a spray of dead flesh as he charges at me with his two rifle spears. Honestly, it's scary as fuck. I have no idea why, but something about this guy sent shivers down my spine. Come on, since when did I become such a pussy? I'm better than this. I rev rabbit punch's engine and swing down with a spirited war cry, but the Sagittarius easily deflects my blow, throwing me off balance. He then follows up by swinging his other rifle down at me. I'm talking a big game here, but frankly, I'm stuck on the defensive. It's not my fault though. You need some kind of monster strength to swing around rifles that big with just one hand. Not only that, this freak has really precise movements. They remind me of close quarters armed martial arts. Every time I try to disengage, he restricts my movements by aiming for my retreat path. If I let my guard down for even a second, he'll shoot me full of holes. I'm doing my best here, but this guy just has too many tricks up his sleeve. At this rate, I'll be cornered before long. I just need to get one good hit on him with rabbit punch and this guy's toast. The flesh-eating bullets will take care of the rest. Problem is, that one good hit is looking really damn hard to get. You're a fucking living dead. Why the hell are you wearing a gas mask? If at least your face was exposed, I could... He stabs his bayonet into my flank, and I prepare myself for the hell to come. He unloads a barrage of bullets, and I can feel a dull heat spread through my body. My coat can't block the bullets at this range, so the magnetic liquid armor disperses instead. It's better for the bullets to pierce right through me than get stuck in my stuck in my insides and fuck up my organs. Converting the pain into anger, I let loose a roar and swing my chainsaw down down. His armor is so fucking sturdy. The centaur connects his two guns and uses his free hand to grab my face. He then tosses me like a ping pong ball. My back slams against the catwalk ceiling, and I rebound back onto the slick ground. It hurts like hell, it's utterly humiliating, and I'm pissed at myself for being so weak. Worst of all, I got a big face full of zombie guts when I hit the ground. This isn't a time to be, gr to be gripping though. My magnetic liquid armor should be able to staunch the bleeding, but not for long. If I don't get treated soon, I'm in trouble. I can already feel my extremity is going numb. I'll only be able to fight at full power for a few more minutes. 
I managed to make the smallest of scratches on the centaur's right gauntlet. In return for getting my stomach pumped full of lead, I dented his armor just a little. I'm not sure if I damaged it enough for my rifle to pierce through, but as things, things stand, I don't have any other. When I reach around behind me, I realize the rifle is no longer strapped to my back. Scanning the area, I see it's fallen in the center of the room, halfway between me and my centaur friend. It probably got dislodged when the fucker threw me. Okay, what to do? Can I reach the rifle before the Sagittarius does, and then get a good shot on him before he cuts me in half? Can I really do all that? Let's be real here. Probably not. Thinking about it logically, there's no way it's happening. Good thing I don't operate on logic. I've gotta make it back alive to Kiri. I promise I wouldn't leave her behind. Besides, I already decided I'm gonna make it back and repent. Hey old man, what would you do in this situation? Seriously? You think that's gonna work? <laughs> Let's do this. I hate my old man. That hasn't changed. But I remembered how he was crying alone that one night at Shinobazu Pond. If that was the real him, then I might be willing to change my mind just a teensy bit. Which is why I'll trust the X-Brain he made, just this once. My life's in your hands. I don't head directly for the rifle. Instead, I stick close to the wall. The Sagittarius takes the bait, changing course for the wall as well. Perfect. I smack the switch on the wall and the elevator starts to rise. I'm not after the flesh-eating rifle. My goal is the gunship on the main deck. The elevator creaks and groans as it rises at a snail's pace. Hurry up, you broken piece of shit! Naturally, the Sagittarius isn't gonna just let me go. He leaps towards the platform. I dodge his charge and escape to the main deck. What? You really thought I was gonna do that, you four-legged freak? What did you do with your arm? It feels like I've been hit by a bulldozer. I nearly black out, but I stick my chainsaw into the floor and hang on through sheer, sheer willpower. Wow, you blocked it with that? <laughs> if I can just withstand the force of his initial charge, his extra legs can't help him for shit. Yeah, look. His back legs are flailing helplessly through the air, and he can no longer push me. Okay, he's still pushing me back. God damn, this guy's strength is insane. Inch by inch, he starts slowly overwhelming me. But then, the elevator comes to a sudden halt. Yeah, I guess that was what we want to do, right? Crush him with the elevator. The Sagittarius's lower half is stuck. He lets out a blood-curling scream that resounds throughout the snow-covered ship. But he won't kick the bucket with just this. I turn back to the main deck. The deck is a sea of putrid flesh, and there's an Oppenheimer waiting in the center. From the looks of it, the guy in the driver's seat got killed by some living dead. Alrighty then. I guess this is a fitting way to finish off that Sagittarius. 
I sprint across the deck and jump into the gunship, taking a gun from one of the SAD soldiers' corpses along the way. Yeah, there's bound to be a lot of guns here on the main deck. There's no living humans inside. Seeing as there's a puddle of flesh at my feet, there is probably a battle up here too. Those flesh dissolving bullets won't be any help in a cramped space like this. They take too long to work. Always gotta make sure you've got the right weapon for the job. I make sure there's no enemies nearby, then head into the cockpit. I shove the corpse out of the pilot's, pilot's seat and take his place. I've practiced piloting gunships a thousand times in simulators. I can do this with my eyes closed. The Oppenheimer kicks up a powerful gale as I bring into the as I bring it into the sky. I'm I, supp I think there's supposed to be an it there. Blowing away the nearby chunks of flesh, stray limbs, and SAD corpses. If I wanted to, I could escape right now. But there's no way I'm running when there's such a delicious meal set out right in front of me. Eat this! I let loose with the gunship's caseless electric 20mm Gatling gun. I doubt that's gonna do much, Ethica. The Sagittarius fights back with his twin rifles. But to an armored gunship, those weapons are no better than pea shooters. I slam the control stick forward. The Oppenheimer's high-speed propellers cut into the trapped Sagittarius's armor, and dusky red blood spurts out. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Before I can turn around, I feel a gun press against the back of my head. I feel numerous impacts against my back as the aerial scattershot grenade Yamanuma threw explodes. The grenade could easily have penetrated my defensive coat, but it's not powerful enough to get through Pavlov's, Pavlov's corpse. Since I didn't have time to run, my ex-brain showed me the only potential hiding place that could save my life, underneath Pavlov's body. I can still feel the pressure from the explosion on my, on my back, but it doesn't hurt. What does hurt is the fact that I failed to rescue Aria. Once again, I let her slip through my fingers. Silence follows the explosion. I crawl out from under Pavlov's unmoving corpse and get to my feet. My back probably looks like a bruised mess right now, but I'm still alive. And as long as I'm alive, there's still hope. Trusting in Iria's words, I dash through the ship. With how much time has passed, I doubt I can catch up to the SAD unit. Even if I could, they have Iria hostage. I can't think of a single way to get Iria back. But I can't help but keep running away. Running anyway. Tokitaka. He's dead? No way! Are you gotta be joking? Tokitaka can't die? What the? Just before I reach the main deck, I find Tokitaka leaning against the wall in a puddle of his own blood. There's a massive hole in his stomach, and his thighs have been shredded. His reinforced bodysuit isn't able to staunch all the blood. I grab his left hand and check his vitals via his conry. Uh, 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 uh. <sighs> I hush Tokitaka. Milgram, the leader of the suicide wannabes, is on this ship? Tokitaka points to the hatch. I can hear the sound of gunship propellers growing louder from outside. I do as Tokitaka says and run outside. 
The gunship's rotors whip up a flurry of smoke and snow on the deck. I spot a familiar figure in the distance, their hair blowing in the cold sea breeze. Hirokurama. His hands are in stun cuffs, and he's tied up. A whole squad of SAD soldiers have their guns trained on him. Even he won't be able to escape from the situation. And yet... <laughs> He has an eerily calm smile on his face. Prod prodded along by the soldiers, Milgram gets into the gunship. He doesn't appear to be resisting at all. I watch on, dumbfounded. It's hard to believe that Milgram, of all people, was captured so easily. Yeah, I think that area can be controlled at will by Milgram right now. As Milgram goes in, Yamanuma comes out, along with... He kicks her off the gunship, and she falls head first onto the deck. There's a deep gash in her stomach. <laughs> Yamanuma ignores her and goes back inside the gunship. How are we gonna get back though? Or I guess we still have the Cetus. Its twin propellers start spinning faster, and it lifts off the ground. A ferocious gust of wind buffets, buffets us. I think that's how you say that, right? As the gunship rises higher and flies away from the amphibious assault ship. Just then, I'm certain I see Iria. She is leaning against the cockpit window and looking down at me. I can't hear her, but I know she's telling me that, there, that there's still hope. I nod in reply. Even after the gunship fades into the snowy gray sky, I continue looking up at her. I mean, I do agree though, as long as we're still alive, there's always hope. Even as bleak as it seems, right? There's always gotta be something that we can do to try to change the situation. But alright, I think I'm going to end the episode right here. That was actually a pretty nice, uh... Cutoff point for once on the episode. I thought that Sona was going to have a confrontation with uh, Milgram after he, we saw Tokitaka dying. Hopefully Tokitaka doesn't die because it feels like he's not, uh, you know, like his death wasn't really that that um, impactful. It's basically there's too little screen time for him to die just a dog's death, right? For someone of his importance, so I still feel like he's alive right now. And we brought his body back with us with the Cetus. Or that's like my wishful thinking anyway. But alright. This is where I'm gonna end the episode. I'm probably not gonna make another episode. Because like I said, I think it's still a good idea for me to just make one episode per day. So tomorrow is a Wednesday, and I am not done with Tokyo Necro, so... Uh, gotta say, but... Kichikuo rants might have to be postponed until next week. But I will still be playing Tokyo Necro on the weekends too, if um, I'm still not done with it by... You know, Friday. But we'll see. But yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Give this video a like if you guys like it. Sub if you guys haven't. Patreon will be getting these episodes early access. And uncensored though. There's not really much of uncensoring in this game. And yeah. I'll see you guys in the next one.